Hello and welcome to GMBN Tech Ask, where you get to ask us any question you like down in the comments of any of our videos. Just use hashtag AskGMBNTech and we'll try and get back to you. So let's kick off with my first question from Chad Stout, who says, how do I know exactly how much pressure you have in your shark when you lose air every time you unscrew your pump? Uh, I have a pump, my shock, I have to pump my shock up to 320 PSI and when I remove the pump and check it again, it's dropped to 280 PSI. Um, so this is a little bit of a trick. You're not actually losing air. So, um, well, hopefully, assuming your pump is not damaged or dirty or there's any opportunity for seals to leak air when it's in use, you won't actually be losing any air when you uh, disconnect your pump. So say you're pumping up to 320. When you disconnect, um, you will often hear some air come out and that might trick you in thinking it's coming out the fork, but generally it's just air that's stored in this hose here. Um, so in the body of the shock. And that is actually the reason why when you reconnect it, you might get a lower reading. So you're saying you get 280 when you put it back on. Um, and all that is, is when you connect the pump to your fork, say for example, the air from the fork will rush in and fill this hose. So it will be effectively a bigger volume and your pressure reading will change. So it may be reading 280, for example, but that's just because you've connected it. Uh, so I think you just need to have a little bit of faith that when you put your pressure up to 320, for example, if that's what you want, um, that it is actually that. However, I will say this is why I'm always an advocate of measuring your sag rather than relying on air pressure. Um, more because it's just a little more accurate. Uh, maybe if your weight changes or if you change spaces in your forks, for example, all of these things will change the pressure in your suspension um, and the pressure that you need in order to maintain a sag. However, if you always measure your sag and you know that if you run 30%, for example, and your sag is at 30% of your travel, regardless of the air pressure in there or the tokens in there or whatever, then you're good to go. And that's always going to be a constant. So um, yeah, a little bit of a trick. You're probably not losing air pressure, but maybe start measuring sag instead. So question two, I've got from Evan who says, I've been having major hand pains during ride on my Forsas XC bike and it gets worse on longer and rougher rides. Uh, just sitting on the bike, standing still for a few minutes, I still have pain. I have a 90 mil stem. I've been thinking about using a shorter stem um, with a bit of rise to at least relief, uh, relieve the pressure on my hands. Yes, well, I, I don't know what your full setup is. I don't know whether your bike is uh, the correct length for you, the right reach, um, for example, but 90 millimeters is potentially quite long. It's long for me. I wouldn't go for that even on my XC bike. Um, so generally I know when I have a longer bike, so for example, my gravel bike has quite a long stem on it. It's quite a long bike and my handlebars are narrow. And every time I get on that bike, I do get a lot more pressure on the palms um, and it does hurt my hands over long rides. So it could be that your stem is too long. Um, so I would go for potentially getting another stem and trying it out. Don't be scared to play with it, to practice with other lengths. Um, bike fitting, I've always said, is a process. It's not a one-time thing. Uh, you might change over time um, and want something different. Uh, I'd recommend maybe borrowing a stem from a friend if you've got anyone who's got spares uh, or maybe buying a secondhand one so that it's a low cost experiment for you. Um, and as much as 10 millimeters can be a big change, um, maybe you wanna go to a slight extreme of 20 millimeters, so going down to a 70 mil stem, um, maybe in the same degree uh, rather than coming up and just change one thing at a time to see how that works out for you. Um, and ride it for say two weeks or a good handful of rides 
to get used to it because your body will need to adjust its position and adjust to the new settings. Uh, if you feel like that helped a little bit, but you need a bit more, you could go shorter or you could go for handlebars that maybe are wider and narrower. Uh, again, try and borrow if you can. Uh, maybe, as you said, you think that uh, an up uh, rise might help. Uh, usually your intuition is pretty good when it comes to bike fit. So yeah, maybe try rise after that and see how that works out for you. Um, but yeah, in summary, you've got to experiment. So question three from Jesper Rasmussen, who says, uh, could you ask the people what the best part of their bike cave is uh, beside the fridge? I'm building a new cave and I'm looking for inspiration. I will give you a guided tour soon. Well, thank you very much. Um, Jasper, I'm sure you're aware because you've said bike cave uh, that we do do bike cave sections on our tech show every week uh, on Wednesdays. And I have actually favored a lot of bike caves recently. So do look over the last um, couple of months at least to see some inspiration for you. Um, but what I can say in, in summary, the recent ones, the best thing and the best thing about my workshop is space. I think space is an absolute premium. There's nothing more annoying than shifting around your bike, especially if it's in the stand and you're working on it and not having enough room to do what you need to do. Um, to achieve this, a lot of our fans and watchers have had really innovative uh, bike racking systems if they have bikes in the workshop to clear up that space um, and racking systems for tools as well so that you can open up that workshop more. Uh, personally, I have a trolley, which is my work surface. So like a surface like this, which actually moves around and that gives me the opportunity to put it where I need it, but also get it out of the way if I don't want it in the way. Um, but yeah, if anyone's watching, if you have a bike cave, then let Jasper or Jasper know down in the comments below uh, what you think is the most valuable thing in the bike cave. Uh, question four is Matej Bodeleg. Sorry, probably pronouncing that wrong. Uh, I have a nine speed shifter and cassette and a 10 speed derailleur removed from the new bike. Uh, will it work together? N not really. It, it won't be great, um, if at all. Uh, so the shifter um, moves in, you know, nine speed is nine increments um, and the cassette is lined up to that. Uh, the derailleur on a 10 speed assumes that there's 10 cogs in the same space as your uh, nine speed cassette. So it has slightly different increments. It will move probably not enough for some of the cogs. Uh, you might find you won't access all of the gears uh, or they'll just all be clicking and not very good. Um, so generally speeds are not compatible with speeds so you might have to uh, look at an alternative derailleur perhaps for that. Question five, Jose Ojeda uh, says, I have a Foxflow X2 shock and I'm having issues setting up the sag. I'm 198 pounds and to get 30% of sag, I need to pump the shock up to 270 PSI, which feels too close to the max pressure. Would I benefit from using volume spaces? Will that help me reach 30% sag with less pressure in the shock? Um, I have a similar issue with the fork, but not as extreme. Um, so your Fox Flow X2, the max pressure on that is 300 PSI. So you said you going up to 270 PSI, that is fine. They've put max pressure on that for a reason. As long as you don't exceed 300 PSI, you're fine, but you can certainly get close to it. Um, if, for example, you want to use volume spaces, as you mentioned, uh, it can adjust the volume, obviously, and that can adjust the pressure uh, a little bit. Um, it might not be a lot. Uh, volume spaces are more to sort of change the feel of your suspension. As you dive into your travel, it will start to feel a little more resistance in the bottom of your stroke. Um, but it won't help you with your sag because that is the initial stroke, effectively. Um, so do go close to the max pressure if you need to in order to set up your sag. Um, however, if you're running at 30 PSI because um, 
because of the pressure that it allows you and you feel like that is perhaps a little too soft or unsupportive then you may want to go to a service technician uh, a suspension specialist for example um, and talk to them about shim tuning um, so i did a video uh, about a year ago on setting up suspension for a particular body weight. Uh, I'll leave the link in the description below. And because I'm really on the lighter end of the scale, um, we retuned the shock to have different shims in it. So effectively, they're like little spaces that move through the oil of your fork, and you can have a different stack of different sizes to make it either easier or harder to go through your suspension. Um, as you are on the heavier side, you will activate your suspension a lot easier. So if you went for a heavier weight uh, tune, you could make it harder for your suspension to activate. And what that will do is if you find you're running your compression damped all the way on and you've got not much room to play with and it still feels soft, it will make your overall suspension feel a little firmer so that you can reposition that compression and rebound dial somewhere in the middle and have more to play with like a sort of average uh, weight rider because that's what suspension is set up for. So. Um, a little bit of a wordy response there, but ideally, as long as you're not going over the max, you're fine. Just try and set up that sag as best possible and maybe speak to a specialist about a retune. Uh, so question six, final from CRA55, who says, I recently acquired a steel frame. It's been fairly heavily used and has some paint chips and some surface rust forming over those chips. Um, I want to do a little touch up. I've seen suggestions from soda, of soda and WD-40. Uh, I just want a mild clean up. What do you suggest? Okay, I actually did a video um, about a year ago testing uh, three or four different types of products on uh, surface rust on a chain, granted, but it should still apply. Um, do check that out so you can see the difference that it made and how easy or hard it was to scrub it with a um, couple of different bristled brushes as well that I tested. Um, but generally, a, if you're buying from new a rust specific treatment, uh, it worked best for me. Um, and also a stiff bristle brush, maybe even uh, a metal one, depending on how gentle you want to be with your with your frame. Uh, maybe nylon if you just want a little bit of uh, a surface brush up. Um, perhaps even some rubbing alcohol over there to sort of give it a sort of a final clean up. Um, but if you're thinking, you have mentioned doing a little touch up, not a full repaint, if you're going to be touching up those sort of paint chips as well, maybe even get a really fine grit sandpaper and give it a light um, sand over as well, just to sort of take the edges off your paint as well. And then maybe the new paint that you touch up with uh, will sit a little nicer and be a little bit more seamless. Um, but yeah, do check out my video. I'll put that link in the description and you can see for yourself how effective uh, the different methods are. Um, and that's all we've got time for today. So if you have any questions of your own, don't forget to use hashtag AskGMBNTech down in the comment of this video if you like, and we'll try and get back to you.